Thank you. Two remotes, look out. <laughs> um, how many of you are brave enough to admit that you belong to a cult? Show of hands. There's a few wild people in the audience. All right, very good. Well, you know, but not many of us are. And, you know, it's not something that most of us would readily admit to. Why? Is it because that cults employ sinister methods of uh, getting us to believe things and to follow them seemingly against our will? Or in doing so, that we're admitting to some kind of lack of self-control or inability to resist their persuasive power? Well, we're here in Kingston, Canada tonight. We're about halfway between Toronto and Montreal. So let me ask this. Who here is a Montreal Canadiens hockey fan? Nice. All right, well, let me ask this. Are there any Toronto Maple Leafs fans in the audience tonight? All right. <laughs> Speaking of a cult. <laughs> but nobody would admit to belonging to a cult, yet everyone's very quick to express their fanaticism for a pro sports team. Eh? And in certain social situations, we often find ourselves spontaneously evangelizing to others about a favorite product or service that we've purchased or an amazing destination that we've been to. Well, just like sports teams, these products and services and destinations are all brands that we love, brands whose power and control, whose spell and charm we have helplessly fallen under. We certainly don't love all the brands that we choose, but some of the brands are drastically more meaningful to us. We're proud to associate with them. We advocate for them without incentive. We rise up to defend them against others who criticize them. We give them the benefit of the doubt, and we forgive them when they mess up. The world's most coveted brands have somehow succeeded in getting us just not just to buy, but to buy into them, to belong. In fact, these brands are a lot like cults if you think about it. They command irrational levels of allegiance and diehard devotion over us, so we choose them time and again without second thought. They evoke fanaticism in the form of the positive word of mouth that we spread as in our effort to recruit others. They make us feel a sense of community and a sense of belonging, like insiders. And we proudly display their religious symbols on our apparel and sometimes even permanently tattooed on our bodies. They somehow brainwash us to mindlessly ignore the very rational appeals of competing brands or cheaper alternatives so that they can reap the benefit of maximum profit margins. You know, we all have our own personal brand allegiances. The most successful brands are really just kind of like modern day cults in disguise. And we all belong to at least one. But we don't often think about why we're so fanatical about these brands we so slavishly adore, these cults that we belong to. But six years ago, I'd become fascinated with the subject See, that was the time when my colleagues and I were busy reinventing our marketing firm. We were just coming out the other side of the ec economic meltdown, and we were troubled by a few things that we'd taken notice of. We saw how the average lifespan of a publicly traded company had decreased from over 50 years in the 1900s to now just 15 years. To us, clearly the rules of sustainable commerce weren't working like they used to. We saw that the cost of broadcast advertising had increased seven to nine times since the 90s, despite the fact that consumers' attention to ads had decreased from 90% to less than 20% by 2012. Brands were spending more than ever just to get noticed by consumers who were trying harder than ever to ignore them. We saw how respected industry publications were professing that advertising no longer works anymore. You know, when magazines like Advertising Age said it, alarm bells should have rung out in marketing departments around the world. But they didn't. But as we observed these negative things, we also noticed something very encouraging. We discovered that there were handfuls of brands who hadn't just survived economic adversity, but they've thrived in spite of it. We also noted that these brands, who were, were spending comparatively little on traditional forms of marketing, like advertising. You know, that was heresy to us marketers. And these brands weren't discounting. These brands weren't couponing. 
These brands weren't buying consumers' attention in business the way that most brands do. Yet they had somehow won the allegiance of die-hard, fanatical customers that advocate on their behalf and spread the word without incentive. These brands didn't just have customers. These brands had believers. These brands had cult followers. You know, as marketers, we were really intrigued by the power that these brands had over customers, and we became obsessed with these brands. You know, if you're a, a business leader or a marketer, you might think that being labeled a cult isn't a desirable achievement. But the profit that a cult brand enjoys from irrationally loyal fans with excessively high customer lifetime value is something that's extremely desirable. If only we could unlock that secret. Then we could teach that secret to other brands, brands that had the same aspiration to, uh, to, to acquire staunchly loyal customers, brands that wanted cult followings of their own. So we investigated. It didn't take us long until we found a research firm out of New York that had been studying brands like this for many years, and they'd concluded that brands with the highest level of customer loyalty, brands that dominated their categories, were all brands that enjoy incredibly high levels of customer engagement. Now, engagement is a consumer's willingness to spend not just their discretionary money, but their discretionary time with a brand for some kind of a mutual benefit. And it's because they, they, they feel an, an emotional attachment or a bond with the brand. We also discovered that the, those brands with the high levels of customer engagement were in turn substantially more profitable than their peers and competitors. And they, they weathered economic adversity better. They were almost recession-proof. You know, more and more to us, engagement was looking like the holy grail of marketing. But what was the secret? What did cult brands do to foster such high levels of engagement in their customers? There's no mention of this in any of the textbooks that we had in our library. There were volumes written about brand loyalty theory, but relatively little on the subject of engagement. Clearly, these brands were employing some mysterious tactics that had eluded most of us other marketers. There had to be some kind of cover-up, almost. I mean, so little information existed that we knew we must be onto something. So we identified several hundred cult brands from around the world, and we began to uh, examine their behaviors. We looked for anomalies, things that they were doing that their peers and competitors were not. We started connecting the dots and fitting the pieces together. We saw patterns of behavior emerging. These were commonalities that, um, you know, exposed where these brands were investing the majority of their resources as opposed to where other brands were. And we began grouping these attributes together, and slowly, six major areas revealed themselves to us. We realized that we'd inadvertently uncovered the black art that the world's most coveted brands practice daily to forge deep affinity and devotion. These were the secret brand-building tactics that mattered most. And we concluded that their success had more to do with their brand culture and the courage of their leadership than with their marketing prowess. Clearly to us, these were principles that could be learned and applied. So we made it our mission. We made it our mission to not just expose these principles, but to teach them, teach them to other brands and other organizations who are brave enough and forward-thinking enough to radically reorient themselves around these six areas. And I'm going to share them with you now. Cult brands endeavor to be remarkable in everything that they do or sell. Mm -hmm. And I use the term remarkable in its truest sense. It's the ability to evoke a verbal response or a remark from consumers. Because here's the thing that cult brands understand. Mediocrity does not win fans and loyal customers. Cult brands exploit the human desire to share by intentionally creating social currency. They know that doing something or providing something that's truly exceptional is guaranteed to get people talking. And what better form of marketing is there? You know, when Apple released the first iPod back in 2001, they knew that a thousand songs in your pocket as a tagline was guaranteed to make music lovers gasp in astonishment if they hadn't already done so at the product design itself. And the rest is history. You ever been watching the hockey game on TV and been interrupted by a commercial for Tesla cars? I've never even seen a Tesla ad. No idea if they even exist. Yet everyone 
everyone is talking about how amazing their electric cars are. That's probably why 400,000 customers have paid $1,000 each to reserve a Tesla Model 3. That's a car that doesn't even exist yet, and one that they probably won't even get until late 2018. See, cult brands command consumers' notice and attention so they don't have to waste money on expensive advertising, trying to fool people into convincing that they're worthy. The most successful brands stand for something bigger than they make or sell. These are brands driven by a powerful ethos, a higher purpose. A study by Havis Media showed that purposeful brands outperform the stock market by 120%. It's kind of funny because that same study also showed that 73% of brands wouldn't be missed by consumers at all if they disappeared entirely. Call brands succeed in getting customers to buy them again and again because they first get them to buy in to their noble cause. They espouse a shared purpose with consumers that inspires them to choose them over completely acceptable alternatives. And this is how Dove, through their campaign for real beauty, grew from a $200 million brand in the 1990s to a cult brand that's worth over $4 billion today. That's why Patagonia enjoys a cult following. Not because of their amazing outdoor gear, but it's because they've tapped into their customer's desire to cause no harm to the planet. Cult brands like Patagonia spend way more time explaining their reason for being and way less time explaining the features and benefits of their products and services. They don't just give consumers cause to buy. They give consumers cause to care. Care enough to buy from them over anyone else. Call brands focus on being inspiring to their internal audience first. You know, contrary to popular belief, cult followings don't spontaneously materialize amongst a group of external consumers. Call brands focus their marketing efforts as much on their employees as they do on consumers, and it's been proven to pay off. A 2013 study showed that brands who increase employee engagement levels also increased profit. Speaking of profit, at WestJet, has anyone ever flown WestJet? All employees at WestJet share in the company's profits, which makes them genuinely interested in contributing to the brand's success. The internal mantra at WestJet is, we succeed because I care. And that's probably why 49% of Canadians choose WestJet as their preferred airline and only 35% choose Air Canada. This here is Tony Shea. Tony Shea is the founder and CEO of Zappos. Tony's empowered every employee in the entire organization at Zappos to do whatever it takes to wow customers. In fact, they celebrate call center staff who keep customers on the phone for hours instead of minutes. As a result, Zappos not only reaps the benefit of delighted customers, but they reap the benefit of maximum profit margins because they never, ever sell anything at a discount. Their customers are willing to pay full price every time. Call brands know that creating believers begins on the inside with employees, especially frontline staff who interact with customers on a daily basis. Cult brands exploit a fundamental aspect of human psychology. See, we humans are hardwired through evolution to instantly assess the intentions and abilities of others to do us harm or do us good. And we perceive brands the same way that we perceive other people. In 2010, a group of social psychologists found that the human traits that brands exhibit influence 50% of all purchase intent, of all loyalty, and the likelihood to recommend. That's extremely significant. And that's why instead of advertising or discount, discounting, Lululemon employs community ambassadors to recruit their customers. These are local yoga or fitness instructors who have great influence over their own followings, followings who represent target Lulu customers. And Lululemon's personified their brand as this, you know, super positive life coach who cheers you on towards your goals. And that's how they've grown from, that's how they've grown to a brand that has 200 stores in two continents. 
That's probably why we also forgive them when they imply that we're too fat for wearing their see-through yoga pants. <laughs> Who owns a pair of these? Obviously, <laughs> everyone probably, right? I mean, who doesn't own a pair of these? Um, you know, Converse doesn't sell millions of all-star shoes because consumers aspire to be a basketball player like Chuck Taylor. People love them because they fulfill a deep desire to express the same independence and rebelliousness as John Lennon or Joey Ramone or Kurt Cobain did when they wore them. Figures that they not only know and recognize, but Figures that they idolize. The brands that we consumers bond with are those that we most easily relate to and evaluate based on their human characteristics. Call brands just don't treat their customers as passive buyers. They treat them as active participants in the ongoing development and improvement of their offerings because they know that their biggest ideas are gonna come from their fans, not from their employees. So they build and nurture communities of fans as forums for generating and testing new ideas. And that's why half the Fortune 500 have made co-creation an integral part of their innovation strategy. That's also why 0% of Lego's product development happens in-house, zero. Lego's head of community business says that 99% of their brand talent doesn't even work for the company. It's all in the community. Now, I'd hazard a guess that most average brands don't even have a head of community business. Um, Mountain Dew runs an online community of avid fans that they call the Green Room. They use it to test every single idea that they have. You even have to apply to get in. Last year, they let the fans of the Green Room decide which one of two flavors would live or die and six million votes were cast. Six million Mountain Dew customers cared enough to talk to the company and tell them which flavor. You know, in a declining category, Mountain Dew has had 20 straight quarters of growth. Not only that, but Mountain Dew is actually the number one product purchased at US gas stations by a long shot. <laughs> it's because cult brands prioritize listening over telling, right? They empower customers to feel a sense of ownership over the brand that cements their loyalty. Cult brands become so highly relevant that they can't be ignored. They weave themselves into the fabric of pop culture. They pervade their customers' lives through a multitude of touch points that surrounds them, that envelops them. Cult brands intercept customers rather than interrupt them with irrelevant communications. You know, I have two kids, and let me tell you, Disney has been ubiquitous in our household since the baby showers. <laughs> the movies, the toys, the clothes, the books, the apps, the games, the food even. Seriously, my three-year-old daughter eats frozen Cheerios for breakfast. That's no joke. You know, it's inevitable that one day we'll be making the holy pilgrimage to Disney World. <laughs> you remember when Red Bull dropped Felix Baumgartner from the edge of space? Did anyone here tune in to see that? Pretty amazing, eh? You know, instead of ads, Red Bull invests in creating experiences, or sponsoring events, or sponsoring athletes, or creating documentary films that challenge consumers to dream of what they can achieve when they're energized. In 2014, Red Bull made over $6 billion. Cult brands like Red Bull know that actions speak louder than words. They don't buy impressions, they make them. By shifting investment away from traditional tactics into these six areas, I believe that any organization can become a cult brand. And we all belong to at least one. I'm Rob Howard. That's my idea worth spreading. Thank you.